Amos 9, verse 7-15 Are you not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Saith the Lord, Hath not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kerr? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, The evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all of the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that a plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities, and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, and drink the wine thereof, and they shall also make gardens, and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Greetings. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean, your host. The website is www.scriptureandprophecy.com. Today we are doing our gospel portion and are studying the book of Acts. And what I just read to you was actually the prophet's portion for today. And uh, for that schedule, I go to TorahPortions.org, and that's where I find that, that schedule, just in case uh, you were curious. Uh, so today's profit portion uh, is, hang on, I have it pulled up for you here, the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 28 through 34, dealing with when Jesus is explaining uh, what the greatest commandment is. And then, of course, we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. We're going to read chapter 18. And the story continues to follow Paul as he travels and diligently works to spread the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what we're working with. And we're going to start with our gospel portion real quick. I just want to thank those of you who pray and those of you who contribute and make this podcast possible, thank you so much for all your prayers, all your uh, con contributions, and just thank you for supporting this work and making it possible. And if you're someone who is being blessed by this and you want to support it, uh, you can do that by going to scriptureandprophecy.com. There's a donate tab or subscribe tab or a P.O. box. Uh, or if you're listening on YouTube, all the links are in the description below. All right, let's do with let's start with our short uh, gospel portion again, Mark chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight through thirty-four. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, "Which is the first commandment of all?" And Jesus answered him, "The first of all commandment is." Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, just so you know, Jesus is not just popping off something random here. Typically, what Jesus is doing, if you're paying, if you pay attention, and you know your Bible, or you've got some nice cross-reference tools like eSword, you'll see that he is quoting a scripture. And he happens to be quoting Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, which says, "Hear, O Israel." The Lord our God is one Lord. And so he says that's what the first commandment is. The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Verse 30, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like 
namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all thy heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, and he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. All right, so Jesus tells us, you know, and we, we see it in the other Gospels too, where he makes statements like they all, you know, all the commandments hinge on these two, right? You see that kind of verbiage. Love your God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is the same, love thy neighbor as thyself. As thyself. And it's pretty simple. You know, if you are loving God with all your whole heart and soul and mind, you're going to walk in obedience. You're not going to dare set up idols and worship idols. If you're loving your neighbor, you're not going to covet his possessions. You're not going to steal from him. You're not going to kill kill him. You're not going to bear false witness against him. You're not going to covet his wife. Right? And so all the commandments really fall under these two. If you're obeying the first two, the other ones just kind of fall in place. And that's why those two are the greatest. All right. Let's move on and resume our study and our story in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, We're ready for chapter 18, Paul going to Corinth. Verse 1, King James Bible. And these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born on Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, and abode with them, and wrought for by their occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was. Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment, and he said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. All right, so as was a custom, whenever he would come to, whenever Paul would come to a new city, he would immediately start going to the synagogues on the Sabbath and start preaching to the Jews and opening up the scriptures and trying to share with them that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was Mashiach. And he would always be greatly resisted. There might be a couple that would believe, but for the most part they would just gather together, stir up trouble, uh, hire people to go and to stir up the crowds. And so at this point he's saying, you know what? After they blasphemed the name of Jesus, it says he shook his rim and he said unto them, Your blood is going to be on upon your own heads. And from now on, I am going to the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles were receiving this news with the readiness of mind and an open heart. Verse 7, And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. You know what's interesting is the Lord appears to Paul in a vision at night and says, look, you need to stick around and don't be afraid to preach and don't worry about persecution here 
because I have many people in this area. You know, everything is spiritual, right? And there's spiritual warfare, and there's, a, you know, the Paul tells us that we're not at war with actual human beings, that there's principalities and powers in the air and all that. And I just wonder where there's big gatherings, big communities of Christian people, uh, strongholds where there's a lot of people of the faith, if the corruption and the evil and the persecution is less just as a result of the spiritual warfare. You know, there's, you can see this in the United States. Um, there's certain states that are still strongholds of conservative Christian values, right? And lots of church to people. And within those states, there's a lot less of the corruption. Uh, obviously, obviously, the worldly evils and corruptions are everywhere, but... You'll notice that in those certain states, it's just, it's safer to be a Christian. It's, you're less likely to find yourself being tied up in some weird lawsuit. You're less likely to be attacked for your faith or your church to be attacked. The, just the overall safety and freedom and common respect for mankind is different than when you go to some of these other states in the country, and you know what they are, right? Do I, do I? Surely I don't need to name them. Everybody knows what they are. And you're, you're an outcast in those particular social environments in certain cities in the United States where it's actually dangerous to be a Christian, where you're likely to find yourself tied up in some weird lawsuit, some form of persecution, I just wondered. I just I was just thinking about that. I don't really have anywhere to go with that other than to say where God's people are plentiful, there's peace and prosperity and freedom and goodness. And where the God's people are few, there's corruption and wickedness and perverseness and every form of evil. Moving forward, verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Verse 12. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made instruction, insurrection, with one accord against Paul, and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would I that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of the words and names and of your laws, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sethnus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus, and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. You know, this is one of the verses where uh, we could look to that might seem to indicate that it's still important to pay attention to the feast. Uh, Because in this situation, they're asking Paul to stick around. And he's saying, no, I must by all means keep the feast that's in Jerusalem. And so he's traveling to Jerusalem to keep the feast. Verse 22. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed 
and went over all the country of Galatia, or Gal- Galatia, and Pergia, in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born to Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took unto him them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. That, my friends, is the end of chapter 18. One last little thing to point out. You'll notice you have this this guy says that he was a Jew named Apollos. And he was mighty in the scriptures, meaning he, I mean, he knew the scriptures, right? He knew it well, and he was preaching boldly. But the only thing that he knew at that time or understood about Christianity was the baptism of John. And so did Aquila and Priscilla act like Christians do today, that they go to the comments section on his YouTube page or or send them emails and rebuking him because all he knew was the baptism of John and telling him how he's an idiot and because this is the kind of stuff I see Christians doing to each other I don't really receive a lot of that I receive some of it but I go to other videos and other things where I'm seeing people just attacking the presenter just with all cruelty and all pride Um, I've had people come to my comment section and tell me that my ministry is worthless because I mispronounce the Hebrew word mystrium which is Egypt and Hebrew. And I'm like, are you guys, are you kidding me? Notice what Priscilla and Aquila do. They notice that he's, wow, this guy's preaching boldly. Uh, But unfortunately, all he knows is uh, the baptism of John. So it says that they they took it unto him. So they they just kind of came unto him, brought him to the side, and and then shared with him the rest of the gospel, right? It says they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And then it says, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much, which believed through grace, and he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. There's a lot that we could learn from the book of Acts about what it looks like to follow Jesus and to be a Christian and to share the good news and to be a living sacrifice for God. I pray that the podcast has blessed you this morning. And, um, you know, I've been getting some really good feedback on the new series, Watching for Messiah. Uh, And I'm happy to hear that. I think it's really been, so far, it's been the most blessed series that I've been putting together since uh, the Walking in the Wilderness series that we did a couple years ago. And maybe the Book of Revelation study that we did a few years ago. And so, thank you for your encouragement and your encouraging words about that series. And Lord willing, I'm going to continue to do it because there's several more aspects to cover, several more scriptures to cover. And so... I would foresee that going on for several, several more weeks. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be back with you guys Friday morning. Um, We'll resume our study in the Dead Sea Scroll book known as the Ancient Book of Jubilees. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time, God bless.